I used to um, really criticize, be critical of um, my church growing up when I became a Christian. Um, raised in the Presbyterian Church and in high school when I became a Christian. Uh, and I prayed that prayer where he asked Jesus into your heart. And I called our pastor, Mike, who was probably the best pastor I've ever known in my life. He was the kind of guy who actually visited people. <laughs> you don't see that very much anymore. There's usually the dude that's paid to go visit people because he's the preacher, right? <clears throat> and that got lost in that aspect. Mike was the kind of guy when one of our kids were sick or something, he'd be the first one at the hospital and made sure the church paid the $200 to get, get them in there. Did that with my nephew uh, one time when he had croup and knew, knew if my sister didn't have it, boom, you know. And, um, and yet I criticized Mike because I told him he wasn't biblically based, that his preaching was watered down, that he wasn't preaching with the Holy Spirit, that he wasn't bringing people and giving them an opportunity to receive Christ. And Mike would just look at me with loving eyes at the same time that it looked perplexed like. And I told him the day, not I, I told him I had received Christ. I called him and told him. And he goes, I thought you already did that. Because I had gone through confirmation and went through that whole process. And so through high school, I kind of felt like I was right and they were all wrong. Uh, they used to joke about the Presbyterians being the frozen chosen. <laughs> right, because it was old, you know, and I was going to coffee house places where they were rocking out and singing about Jesus and the whole thing. And what I didn't understand was that he was being patient with me and he was loving me where I was in my spiritual journey, that I wasn't wrong, but even though I thought he was wrong, we were both right. And that aspect of embracing that aspect of it, and we developed a resistance to wanting to believe somebody else could be right, don't we? We, 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 uh, we define our battle lines between what I believe is right and that other aspect of it that seems foolish or wrong. And we do that in so many different aspects of it. And you think about it, our culture, that's what divides us, isn't it? is it's our determination to dig our heels in and be right. And when that happens, even if we are right, you guys, we're wrong. We're wrong because the spiritual life is the life of non-resistance. Um, I told you what my theme was uh, for New Year's and I told you I wasn't really comfortable with it. Um, I've changed it. <laughs> My theme now is uh, to live the spirituality of non-resistance because I have to be clued in to when I'm being resistant. When am I being resistant? You know, even this morning, last night this morning, I, I still have the uh, New Year's, Christmas, holiday, bleh, you know? I haven't been doing much reading uh, to keep myself, um, you know, aware and, and in, in communication with the God I believe in, and I find myself falling into that cloud of apathy. Anybody feel that? You know, has felt that? Yeah. And so there is a way out, but it's really hard to find the way out when I'm feeling resistant. You know, I'd just rather do this instead, you know? Um, and so, um, so it's, it's hard to get out of that unless we make a deliberate question of what am I believing to be true and looking at my non-resistance. So I want to take a look at um, a guy who showed a lot of non-resistance and you guys know this story and I like revisiting these stories more than once uh, as it's obvious and um, this one is about Jonah. The one about jo Jonah is, you know, when, when we listen to it in Sunday school, um, I, by the way, I wish I could go back to Pastor Mike, my friend, and tell him, God, you were so right. You were so right. And thank you for showing me what grace is and was when I thought I had the corner on grace. 
because his grace did not have a yeah but at the end. My, his had a period, grace period. That even in what we're doing now, we are surrounded by grace. Grace isn't in here. Grace is the thing that surrounds us. In our failures, in our awkwardness, in our apathy, we are functioning under the protective and will and care of God, and that is grace. That I come to the end of myself and I realize I've gone off track and I'm flailing, and then I come back and I realize that in God's eyes, nothing's changed. That it's the same in the way that God sees me. So if my goal can be a spirituality of non-resistance, then it can awaken me to those times. I'm being resistant right now. I'm being resistant. Even if I am right, am I open? Am I able to finish the sentence with I could be wrong? Even as a preacher or a pastor or a teacher or an educator, even as a sponsor or a mentor or as a father or wife or child, can we end the sentence with, this is what I believe to be true, but I could be wrong. Because in, in, in a, a very wise a uh, young man who was in recovery said to me one time when it clicked, and he goes, oh, so theology and belief systems are kind of like concrete. And I go, well, no, it's not like really concrete. No, no, he goes, wet concrete, wet concrete. And they have to keep it turned all the time because what happens when it's poured? It sets and it becomes solid. He said, so our faith and our belief should never be poured out, otherwise we're gonna become set in our ways. Isn't that brilliant? So even to the point of saying, somebody, uh, uh, a, a fundamentalist comes to me and says, Henry, do you believe that Jesus was God? And that's all they care about. I, and I say, yes, but I could be wrong in my understanding. It freaks them out, right? That doesn't mean that I don't believe. What it means is I, confess my humanness and always being open to an understanding of what that means for the union of Jesus with God. What is that? And even in the first move that Jesus made with John the Baptist, he started out with non-resistance. John says, you're the man. Jesus said, baptize me. John says, no. Jesus says, it's necessary. And then John says, okay, then I'll do it. John saying, okay, I'll let you serve me. You know, will you, will you let God love you on his terms? We have to have a sense of non-resistance to let God love us on God's terms, right? Um, and that's, that seems strange, but we do. I will let you love me, God, but I'm going to work really hard to fix these things in my life so that you can love me more. So that I, it doesn't work that way. So Jonah, um, he was, uh, was going to go to Nineveh because, because God had called him to go to Nineveh and uh, send a message to the Assyrians and tell them that, um, that they need to get their life straightened out and ask for forgiveness and that God will love them and everything will be really great. And, and Jonah is really ticked off because... Uh, they had a history of torturing him and his family and his tribe for years. And so he says, no, he doesn't want to. So it says in, in John or Jonah 1, it says, Jonah rose up to flee to Tar Tarshish. He ran. He ran. Okay? He, was, he ran like Tom Brady after he throws a pass, you know? <laughs> I'm just messing with it. I just, my, I was watching a game yesterday and my son was like, he just, just elevates Tom Brady to a God. And I said, do you see how he ran after he threw it? And then he complains and got, anyway, that's one of So, um, so Jonah rose up, he, he rose up to flee to Tar Tarshish. He runs. What is he running from? It says he's running from the presence of the Lord. Oh. Boy, he has the same illusions we do, that we can actually run from the presence of the Lord. All we can do is run fr from God in our awareness or our unawareness. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm like a little kid going like this, playing hide and seek like this. If I can't see you, you probably can't see me. That's the way we live. 
God is still there, so he can't run from the presence of God. So he goes and he gets in this boat uh, with these, these sailors, and it says the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his individual God. And then they go to Jonah and they go, hold on, wait a minute, where do you come from? Who's the God you worship? What's going on? Okay, because they were worshiping gods they invented. And so he's like, I, I am Hebrew, and I, and I come from, um, uh, he says, I'm, I'm Hebrew, and I, and, I, and I come from a family that worships the God who is, and I'm afraid of him. Right when he says he's afraid of him, um, he says, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And then they're like, they became frightened and said, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. So here's these pagans who are saying, why are you doing to this? You're not following the God you believe in. You're being resistant to the God you believe in. It didn't matter to them anymore who this God was. They believed that you don't do that. You know, that's why I think Gandhi had said that he wasn't a Christian because the people, even Christians don't believe in <laughs> and live the Christian life. So, like, so what's the point? It's a, it's a spirituality of, non, of non-resistance, not resistance. So he's the, uh, these men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, that that was key to this whole thing. So they're like, what should we do? What should we do with you in order for calm to come? And he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. So it's all about him. Throw me into the sea. I would rather be thrown into the sea than become non-resistant and freaking go to Nineveh. <laughs> okay? Listen to this quote. Um, I know I'd like to, but if I don't grab the right paper, not that one. Okay. Um, this is uh, from the English poet W.H. Auden, and it's, uh, it's quoted in um, uh, Breathing Underwater. We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the present and let our illusions die. Isn't that true? We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the present and let our illusions die. Now you think in terms of whatever illusions that you have. You think in terms of just mere apathy of taking that next step. So if we were to look at um, this part of the belong, believe, behave, then we're looking at this part. We're looking at believing. Okay, we get the idea that we belong. We get that. Okay, Henry's hammered it home Sunday after Sunday at midweek and in our dreams now. It's haunting us, the <laughs> fact that we belong, all right? The three Bs, belong, believe, behave. Now getting to the belief part is where we begin to deal with this, I, I, this idea of resistance or non-resistance, okay? So with me, tell me what are some, give me some words that you think of from a religious standpoint when you think in terms of believers or the religious act of believing. What is a, what is a Christian, Christianese word? Faith. Faith. The Bible is true. The Bible's true. We are the one true religion. One true religion. God, what was that? Saved. <laughs> You've been saved. Shine on me. I used to be, but now I'm saved. Do you know Jesus? Okay. That idea of saved has that connotation of this dramatic conversion that takes place in the instant. Okay, that aspect of saved. So what we think that we're being saved of from is what? Hell and damnation and the 101 damnations. And, you know, we're saved from, from damnation and saved from hell. But in this case, when we're looking at the spirituality of non-resistance, we're, we're being saved from ourself. I know somebody said that, but I wasn't ready to, you can high five now that you said it. Um, we are being saved from ourselves because when we have that apathy 
It's not that it's a sin, it's human nature. In order for me to rise above that, I've got to listen down into that part of us that is the spirit. So the spirit to um, calm the soul. So it's working its way out. So in the spirit, being led by the spirit of truth, I now need to check in with my thoughts and go, what am I believing? What are, oh, it's going to be a lot of work to get off my chair. Oh, it's going to be, you know, I can, I can show up at that meeting tomorrow. Um, and we stay in that aspect of, of resistance to that moment of what I'm actually feeling called to by the innermost being, the spirit. Don't you feel that sometimes? You feel a drawing deep inside, but it's such a whisper and your soul's being so loud right now that you have trouble moving on that and acting on that. Okay, so, so this aspect of, of believing is, oh, no eraser. Um, that didn't work. Um, that aspect of believing has to do with our thoughts. It has to do with transforming our thoughts and, and looking at our core beliefs. So when, um, so here, this, this part just cracks me up. Listen to this. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of a fish. Thank you. Uh, from the stomach of a fish. So, so they throw him out of the boat. And um, they, by the way, the pagans started praying to the God of Jonah and not to their made up gods. Isn't that crazy? So you talk about a great evangelist, Jonah. They're scared of him and turning to God. Yeah. And um, so they're praying. Uh, don't, don't you see that oftentimes in people who don't believe at all? They, don't, they say they don't believe in God, they don't believe in God, or people in general don't believe in God. And what's the first thing that happens when we hit tragedy? Pray. All of a sudden, there's a willingness to pray. What might our culture, our individual lives be like if we prayed during the good times? and looked at our non-resistance because there's nothing that can break down non-resistance like desperation, right? When you have nowhere else to turn, all of a sudden you believe in prayer. And the beauty of the, and the humbleness of, of realizing grace is that in your head you're thinking, why would God listen to me? Because I've been resistant my whole life. And then you find out he listens to you anyway and that's where humility comes in. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't deserve this. That's right, neither did anybody else. Don't let them fool you. It's a gift of God, that grace. So check out what Jonah does. He says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and you heard my voice. You had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, uh, I, I had said I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard Vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. You guys, he's saying this from the belly of the fish. <laughs> he is praising God because he is in the fish. He doesn't care how his life was preserved. He doesn't care his condition. He doesn't care about what's going on. He doesn't care about how much darkness he's in. All he's glad is he doesn't have to go to Nineveh. That's all he cares about. That's that aspect of I belong, but now I'm living in my doubts and my inability to move forward. But at least I belong. That's where a lot of grace churches sit in, and, and in the jacuzzi of grace instead of getting off their butts and beginning to take advantage of the benefits that comes with that grace. It's not a yeah, but. And it's a because of. It's a because of God has seen me, loved me, recognized me, acknowledged me, that I begin to walk in spite of my circumstances. So after this, 
It says, now the, Lord, uh, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise. He's not leaving him there. He wants to live in the fish, I guess. You know, He's already picking out stuff. I need a lamp. i got to find me a lamp. You know? <laughs> arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to its proclamation, which I am going to tell you. God does not stop. He does not relent. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Oh, he had already gotten tossed out of the fish. So in his praise, I guess it got pretty exciting in there, and he made the fish vomit. And uh, this is what it says. So the whale vomits, uh, and he comes out of this wonderful dark place. He thought it was wonderful, you know. Uh, and he begins to go through the city one day's walk and cried out and said, Yet 40 days in Nineveh will be overthrown. So he tells them reluctantly. And then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. That's what they did when they mourned uh, death, when they, when they went through this, this period. So the, the king and the people are, are, are in this moment of recognition that they were bad, but that God loves them. Okay. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Um, and then he says, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger towards us that we would not perish. When God saw their deeds, they turned at the, and that they had turned from that way and were going to another way. There's the non-resistance. Um, then the calamity subsided, and he declared he would bring up uh, that he would had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Or you could say they did not bring it upon themselves anymore. Chapter 4 doesn't end there because he has to deal with uh, Jonah. Jonah thinks he's off the hook because he did what he was supposed to do in obedience. He went and he told him. Yeah, he had to do it by getting vomited out of a whale. But then he goes to Nineveh and he tells him what he's supposed to. Can you imagine the way that he said it? Uh, God said that if you got to get it together, he'll forgive you and everything's going to be okay. <laughs> He wasn't exactly excited about it, right? So God's not done with him. And, and this is what Jonah says. He prayed and he said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country would happen? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. What he's saying is, I meant to do that. I meant to do that. Don't you see people do that on a trip? I meant to do that. <laughs> you know. Well, God, you must have meant it uh, for this reason, because look how it turned out. Everything worked out, you know? And it's, it's like my daughter, one time when she was, oh, this is an awful memory. I don't know why I just decided to tell this, but um, <laughs> I, I, picked him up for, I picked him up from school. Uh, she was in, in uh, junior high. No, she wasn't. She was even younger. Andy or Christy was in junior high, and Andy was in like fifth grade. And uh, I picked him up from school, and I'm driving. And I always had to fight off being the mora uh, morality cop in life. You know, I see some things bad. You shouldn't do that. You know, I don't know why. I was just like, I, I still have to fight it off sometimes. You know, and um, and so I pick him up from school, and we're driving back, and we're near the park, uh, getting home. And there's these boys that are crossing the street, not in a crosswalk, and uh, and they're going super slow, and making me stop. And I got ticked. And I opened my door and I said, You guys? And I said something stupid like, I know the principal or something like that, you know? <laughs> and you know what? I got in my car and guess what they did? They slowed down even more. <laughs> and I was like, Oh! And all of a sudden, I, I look in the rearview mirror and there's my oldest daughter going, <laughs> and Andy is nowhere to be found. She has slumped down in the seat. Can't even see her. And I'm like, what? And then I tried to say they were wrong and I was right. And I'm like, did you see what they were doing? Did you see? And she's like, Christy's living like this. And I'm like, what? And she looks at me. She goes, that's the boy that Andy likes. Oh, no. Fifth grade. <laughs> and I'm like, Honey, I don't don't talk to me right now, Dad. <laughs> okay. Drive home. 
<clears throat> come in the house, and you know that awful feeling that you can't take it back. You know, you've ruined their lives. <laughs> and uh, and I go home, and Andy is so verbal, and I don't know where she got it, and I, uh, she just says what she thinks and whatever, and she's loving and compassionate, but man, does she cut to the core, you know? And I'm, I go in the house, and I, I just, I go in the room, I go in my room, and I'm like, I can't take this back. I have lost, I fell from grace with my daughter. We had such a close relationship. I ruined her image at school and whatever. Knock on the door, oh, it's Andy. She opens the door and she goes, Dad, I just wanna tell you, I know how bad you feel about this, but I can do nothing to help you. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't do anything to help you. Um, and I really don't want to talk about it, and I don't know when I'm going to get over this. It left the room! And I'm just like, I'm cooked. I mean, that's it. Our relationship is ruined and whatever. And uh, a few days later, she came home, and she's all happy and everything. And I go, hey, what's going on? How's your day? And she goes, you know what, Dad? She says, I'm really glad it happened because I was so worried about my the way everyone was with me and about whether they certain people like me or not and then with what happened i just realized i don't even like him and i was being something i wasn't and whatever this is she's pretty young to be talking like she goes so i'm actually feel like i'm kind of free and i'm like well and she goes don't say it <laughs> don't say it and that's what jonah was wanting to do see all things work together for you <laughs> All things work together for God. Who called, you know, that's not what that, that doesn't apply here, dude. <laughs> We're going to still deal with your resistance. And he, so uh, uh, Jonah says, uh, oh Lord, therefore, oh Lord, please take my life from me for death is better <laughs> to me than life. He'd rather die in his doom than change. And the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Do you really have good reason to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat for a long time and made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would have happened in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant, but God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. See, he didn't have shade, he got shade, and then he lost the shade. Wow, he's getting jacked around. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. And then God said to him, do you have, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he says, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not even work for and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals? Non-resistance means I get with God's plan instead of my own. I get in the flow of non-resistance. Instead of fighting off the wave like I've taught about and saying don't come, I go and rent the boogie board and ride that sucker in. I get in the flow of, of the work that is God is doing. In addition, we begin to allow God to love us on his terms because you know what? If he would love the people from Nineveh in spite of what they had done, how much more he could love Jonah if Jonah would allow him. So our believing is our waking up and our realization that I don't know everything there is to know. Nevertheless, I will take an action in the face of great fear and doubt because that's when it puts it to work. What are you believing? What are you believing about yourself? You know, what are you believing in your apathy? You know, how, how is life really? Am I in the depths of darkness and I'm basking in that? Or am I willing to be challenged to take advantage of the benefits that come with the fullness of life that God gives? When we, when we are tempted, when we have cravings, when we feel an opportunity to become non-resistant, perhaps it's because there is a moment that is right around the corner that we have never experienced before and those are just being used 
to prevent us from taking hold of that which God has taken a hold of us for. That we've let go of the hand, right? We're like, I can do this on my own. Do you love it when kids do that in the middle of the street? Let go, let go. That's us. I can do this. You're like, hold my hand right now, hold my hand. I don't want to hold my hand because we know the danger. So there's a time for us to hold God's hand, and then there's a time for us where he pats us on the rear and says, have at it, live this life, show up at that thing, go to that meeting, go to that meeting, take that hike, even though you don't feel like it, get your body moving, ask that girl out, ask that guy out, face the possibility of rejection. <laughs> There was like three faces that just went. <laughs> if we live in that fear, if we live in that fear, and you guys, I am putting myself in the same category, then we are settling for the darkness of the belly of the whale or the doom rather than the possibility of change for the first time in our life. And the majority of people in this world are living cautiously and fearful. They're not living this exciting free life regardless of what you see on posted on Facebook. <laughs> That's their safety, is the image that they're putting forward. But who better to live this life than somebody who has realized that the life they were living wasn't life at all? And we gotta have at it, okay? So next week, we will move into the aspect of, of behaving and that behavior and the action taken in the face of, of great fear and doubt. This is not a weak life. This is a strong life that was born out of our weakness. When we brag on our strength, we dig our heels in, we're setting ourselves up for failure and weakness. When we embrace our weakness and the cracks in our walls and the limitations of our soul, it lets the light of God in goes out and we walk where we never walked and we talk to who we never talked to and we find ourselves not uh, oppressed by the headlines by the politics by the religion and we say though I may be in my circumstances nevertheless I am free from the inside out and I will affect my circumstances so we celebrate the weakness that Christ gave as an example. He said, I am broken with you. Share in this. Take and eat and see that the Lord is good. Come as you are. Um, another day, it's, it's, it's somebody else's and what they're going through. And some of us experience grief and loss and some of us experience just the struggle uh, that is going on around. So let's just take a minute together um, and we'll just have a little bit of a moment of silence of sitting with God in whatever it is that we're feeling, whatever it is that's going on. And we'll go ahead and embrace that and be aware of it. Recognize any sense of non-resistance um, and as if you were carrying it in your hands, palms up, let it go for now. Turn the palms over and let it go just for now. And I'll close this one for you. God, we confess our condition. We confess Our times of frustration, we confess that we become weary, tired, unsure, apprehensive. We confess that we worry about how we're being perceived, whether we're understood or misunderstood. 
We confess that we become anxious when those around us suffer or that we have lost them. We confess our inability to completely understand. Nevertheless, we also declare that we are fully present, fully here, surrounded by your love and surrounded by your grace, who does know, who is our posture in our awkwardness and self-consciousness, who is our strength in our weakness, who is our eyes, though we see only now in the present, we come as a child and live in that moment, but we are connected to the one whose eyes see both the beginning and the end. Father, I pray that you will place your hand on the back of our shoulders, our necks, calm us and say, I am with you always, even unto the ends of this earth. Lord, may we come to a place where we can live in the light and never choose the belly of the whale. We are grateful today for your love and compassion. Not that we have gotten it all together, but knowing now that we can let go of the expectations that we were supposed to, we are free. We are free. In the name of the one we call Father, because you are for us, Jesus, because you walk alongside of us, and Holy Spirit, because you are in us. Amen. Amen. See you all. Have a great week.